In December of 2019, Jack a Little Pill, the Alanis Morissette jukebox musical about a suburban Connecticut family struggling with modern life, opened on Broadway to glowing reviews. Critics, while having liked the out-of-town Boston tryouts, had given it a few major notes or improvements, and it seemed that the second premiere had taken it all in stride and become something truly remarkable. Critics and fans alike praised it for breaking the cheesy and messy mold of most jukebox musicals and instead telling a complex and intensely modern story about family, transracial adoption, opioid addiction, sexual assault, and queer identity. News coverage and press releases focused majorly on the creator's dedication to socially responsible storytelling and the numerous sensitivity boards and experts they'd consulted during their processes. It was largely received as a thoughtful and rousing work that intelligently used its 90s pop score to highlight politically relevant topics of the modern day. In March 2020, when all Broadway theaters shut down for reasons of which I am sure you are aware, Jack of the Pill was one of only four musicals to have opened in time to be eligible for New York's most prestigious theater awards, the Tonys, and racked up 15 nominations. For context, the most Tony nommed production of anything in history was the 2015 original production of Hamilton, which got 16 nominations. All of Broadway was beginning to feel the effects of long term closures, but even with that, Jack's Little Pill surely seemed set up for long term success. As the pandemic stretched on, controversy started to drum up on social media over the show's handling of one of its queer characters, a teenager called Joe, played by Tony nominated actress Lauren Patton. In the Boston run of the show, the character had been explicitly non-binary, but the Broadway script had been rewritten to make the character cisgender. Major changes to scripts are the norm in the process of transfers, but the situation seemed... odd? Members of the Jagged Little Pill Company started denying that any changes to Joe's gender had been made, deleting all previously public confirmation of the character's identity, with Patton, who is a cis woman, saying explicitly that Joe was never written as anything other than cis. In the month running up to the Tony Awards ceremony, a protest was held in Manhattan for the better treatment of trans people in the Broadway establishment in response to some somewhat cringe comments by a prestigious producer, and two non-binary former actors from Jack Little Pill, Iris Minas and Nora Shell, were in attendance. At the march, Minas spoke about how he made to feel unsafe as the only trans person in the company at her time of hiring, reporting constant bombardment with invasive questions about her life and identity by the creative team as fodder for Joe's character. Two weeks later, Shell made a public statement about Jack Little Pill not giving them time off for an emergency surgery and forcing them to delay it for an entire month, something they point out as being particularly abhorrent in the context of them being a black trans person seeking gynecological care. Two days after Shell released their statement, the Tony Awards ceremony went forward as planned, and Jack Little Pill walked away with two wins one for scriptwriter Diablo Cody, and one for actress Lauren Patton. Coming so close on the heels of Manus and Shell's allegations, popular opinion on this outcome was... fairly negative. Two lead actors from the show, Sally Rose Gooding and Antonio Cibriano, immediately quit in solidarity, and when another round of pandemic closures hit in December 2021, Jack Little Pill announced that it had closed its curtain for a final time and would permanently close on Broadway. <sighs> now, looking at this mess, a first question might be, gee whiz, that was a quick slide into infamy, why did this happen? To which a first answer might be, rich media producers are often bigoted and profit focused, this isn't a surprise. Uh, trans representation in major media has always been a difficult thing to achieve, with entire documentaries being made about how even the most well-intentioned of projects can often aid negative stereotypes more than they reject them. Transphobia is a very pressing issue in American society today, with only 38% of American citizens thinking greater acceptance of trans people is a good thing, and producers aren't going to want to spend millions of dollars on something that's only going to appeal to 38% of people. Similarly common enough to be obvious is the long history of anti-blackness in every branch of American society, with 31% of black young adults reporting racial discrimination in the workplace. Broadway, being part of American society, is no exception to this. Producers want to make decisions that are profitable. Profitable decisions include sanitizing progressive content and exploiting workers, and the workers it's easiest to get away with exploiting include black and trans people. None of this is a surprise. Water is wet. Karl Marx covered this in 1848, case closed. That is a very broadly accurate answer. It's not at all wrong, but it's also very general and can be applied to similar situations in any media piece or workplace in America. And in many ways, the situation with Jack a Little Pill is particularly emblematic of the current state of the American musical theater industry. To better understand that, we'll need to look at some recent history. 
this is my theater lipstick. Many would point to 2016 as a turning point for U.S. culture, and that moment was compounded particularly hard on Broadway, because 2016 was the year Hamilton became a smash hit. For the first time in a decade, the name of a musical entered the public discourse and became a bona fide cultural phenomenon. It broke box office records left and right, critics raved like nothing else, and audiences flocked in groves. I mean, if you're watching this, then you're probably old enough to remember yourself. It was a massive thing. And quickly, the Broadway establishment seized the moment as an opportunity for some rebranding. The Tony Awards that year opened with a song about how theatre is the most inclusive medium and removed all gun props from performances in order to honour the victims of a recent mass shooting. Press coverage from the following day focused on the contrast of four black actors winning the Tony Awards in a year where all Oscar nominees were white. The medium formerly famous for women expounding the joys of total marital submission through song was getting a cheery progressive makeover, and that was reflected in the slew of warm-hearted social commentary musicals in the following years. Dear Evan Hansen is about the ramifications of poverty and teenage mental illness. Natasha Pierre in The Great Comet of 1812 is an adaptation of War and Peace that made a deliberate point of casting actors of colour to play 19th century Russian aristocrats. The Prom is a show I don't own the cast album of, but is about a lesbian teen fighting her high school after they try and cancel her prom when she tries to bring a female date, and Hades Town spins Greek mythology into a tale of climate change and unionization. On the back of these shows, and many others, 2018 was Broadway's highest grossing year ever, as well as the year of Jack Little Pill's Boston run after years of fruitless workshops. The name of the game was clear. Revolution sells. Unfortunately, when trying to make money in an industry in the midst of record-breaking sales and relevancy, the last thing one wants to do is try and make money in an industry in the midst of record-breaking sales and relevancy. After the box office peak of 2018, a severe market correction began to take place, and summer 2019 saw a dozen show closures and a net loss of $100 million for Broadway. 2019 was also the year that Jack Little Pill was making its last round of writing changes before heading to a main stage. In an industry where long-running hits like Waitress and cult favorites like Be More Chill could be forced to close their doors forever, a show needed to strike a balance between the eye-catching edgy counterculture that had come to be expected and consumer-friendly decisions that wouldn't scare away tourists. This is a balance many shows have struggled to hit, both on and off stage. Dear Van Hansen and Great Comet have both had black actors come forward with allegations of racist mistreatment. The Prom and Hades Town both had to undergo defaying rewrites before their main stage productions, the Prom reassigning much material originally for its lesbian protagonists to straight activist characters, and Hades Town cutting most of its explicitly anti-capitalist lines. Into these trends and in this environment, Jack Little Pill launches Broadway Run. Despite all the marketing around its cutting edge and revolutionary nature, it didn't do anything particularly new. It used as many progressive aesthetics and keywords as possible, reportedly adding in new social issues right up until opening night. It cut any genuinely groundbreaking content that might scare away theatre goers, and it cut costs by exploiting the work of marginalized cast members who held little power. It was revolutionary enough to earn a spotlight, but not enough to be off-putting. Alright, I've been avoiding giving any of my takes so far about the artistic content of the show because every time I try and write it in, I add up adding like 15 minutes of length onto the script. I could do a whole other video about that alone. But I've got a quick like microcosm example of what I mean here. So the second number of the show, or the third if you count the overture, all I really want serves as an introduction to Frankie, the daughter of the house. She's confident, she's opinionated, she's bisexual, she's a black girl who's adopted into a white family in a predominantly white town and has had it up to her eyes with the culture of American suburbia, and thus is really into activism. Jack Little Pill shows us this by doing a protest montage in the background of the scene, where extras come on stage and hold up signs about LGBT issues, immigration, abortion, uh land back, Black Lives Matter, clean energy, gun control, and probably more, but the camera of the bootleg I was watching could only get so much in frame. Five of these seven issues never come up again even once. They are literally just set dressing. The show really, really wants to grab your attention by looking like it has something to say about important issues before dropping the ball completely and saying absolutely nothing. That is fundamentally the problem with the current wave of political musicals. Every new musical is trying to be Hamilton, and Hamilton has received no end of criticism for the way it uses the aesthetics of black liberation movements to tell an American nationalist story while mistreating its black cast members. 
intense, uncomfortable, thorough political narratives do not mix with the high-risk, high-investment medium of mainstage Broadway theatre, especially when all the shots are called by multi-millionaire producers who have spent their whole lives reaping the rewards of the current social order. Progressivism is a good look. Everyone likes to think of themselves as open-minded, but having to face a transgender character on stage or allow a low-status employee medical leave is just a little bit too much for some people. In order to counter the status quo and give voice to the marginalized, risky decisions simply have to be part of the equation, and the current mold of political musicals don't allow for any. The Book of Mormon, the 2011 satire musical about two Mormon teens' mission to Uganda, is, in many ways, the antithesis to Jack Little Pill. It's vulgar, it's offensive, it's insensitive, like in many ways this is a show that does just suck, and also it takes actionable steps to ensure the well-being of its employees and improve its own artistic content. In 2020, when a few dozen of the show's black company members wrote a letter expressing discomfort with the show's material, the lead writers held a two-week-long workshop with them to comb through every scene in the script and make any necessary changes, leading to a version of the show reopening in 2021 that everyone involved felt more comfortable performing and better conveyed its own intended messages. The Book of Mormon is a show that has never tried to be safe and conventional. It is a show that is composed entirely of risky decisions that fuses its capacity to infuriate audiences as a selling point, so it had the room to take these criticisms on board and change. Jack Little Pill has always had to look perfect and unobjectionable, so its revolution was made marketable and all discord was swept under the rug and still started hemorrhaging lead actors. Like all counterculture that tries to go mainstream, it sold itself back into the status quo and lost all its meaning. The water bottle's back out. We have re-entered the casual zone. Okay, so that was meant to be my conclusion. That was the conclusion that I've had written in since the first draft, but actually I've got a little bit more to say. Um, so about two days ago, I was going through this script again um, just to pick out things I needed for filming, and I was re-listening to the Jack Little Pill cast album to double check a few plot beats. And Joe's big song from the second act came on, um, You Oughta Know, and I had the thought, just passively, oh, this is in my range. And then that made me stop because suddenly I had a very like vivid and realistic mental image of what it would be like for me specifically to play this role. And it felt good. It felt good to imagine. Um, now, even with all of the funky Broadway rewrites, I still recognize a lot of authentic experience in Joe. You know, as you can probably guess, I really like doing theater and I am fine with playing female roles, but it's also the only option I really have, so it was kind of a head rush for just like a second to imagine that I could actually play a role made for someone like me. And that's that's not the only thing the show almost like deeply got to me on, um, you know. I'm a non-binary bisexual survivor in recovery for drug addiction. This show played on my heartstrings so well that if I hadn't known about all the behind the scenes stuff, I probably would have been willing to forgive all the shallow writing. But since I did know about the behind the scenes stuff, it made me furious. Because of course they didn't make Joe for someone like me. They made the role for a cis woman while doing some pretty serious harm to people like me. <laughs> that authentic experience I recognize is only there because they mined Iris Minas for personal trauma. Productions targeting me with superficial representation is already annoying, but to do it while forcing someone with severe anemia to delay a surgery for a month while performing eight shows a week, that makes me um, froth with rage a little bit. You know, they were doing that to their vulnerable employees and expected me to pay them for it. It's not that the creators of shows like this are too cowardly to write anything punchy or something. It's that they know exactly what they're doing. They know that musical theater is such a notoriously non-diverse medium that marginalized workers will settle for terrible jobs and marginalized audiences will settle for hollow stories because that is, with a few odd exceptions, all there is. <sighs> there is progress being made. You know, see my first and better conclusion for an example of people trying to do something to make things better. But that feeling of realizing that they were trying to capitalize on some deeply sensitive stuff in me to fund their malpractice was really gross. <laughs> My gratitude for the bare minimum is going to be extending a lot less far going forward. I don't want to be complicit in this anymore. It cut me genuinely brown, brown graking. <laughs> brown graking. Round breaking news, everybody.